Hello everyone, Tom here. This is going to be part of a series I'm going to do showing you components of my audio system in my office. And today I've got a Sansui AU9500 integrated amplifier to show you. This one came out around 1974. That's when my brother bought this one. He handed it down to me and uh, so I'm going to show it to you right now. It's been in pretty much regular use uh, since it was new. A couple of brief breaks, but uh, it's been a great amplifier. Um, but I'll, I'll skip the, uh, the hyperbole and the subjectiveness. I'll just get down to basically showing you what the amplifier is all about. Um, as an integrated amplifier, what that means is basically it has a preamp section and a power amp section. So the preamp section is the part that gives you all the tone controls and input selection, volume and balance. And then there's a power amp section as well that drives the actual speaker. So you can buy a separate preamp and power amp combo uh, uh, individual units, or you can get a combo like this. The next step, of course, would be to add an FM tuner to it, in which case they'd call it a receiver. And that's what most people are familiar with, the receiver. It has basically a, something that pulls in radio signals, FM, AM, and then uh, you have a preamplifier section and a power amp all in one box. So this just kind of breaks out the tuner. Uh, it gives you your choice of that. There was a matching tuner that came with that. I actually use one down here. It's a little, um, it's a Techniques tuner. It works really well, but that's uh, for some other video. But uh, I have other sources tied in this as well, but let's get uh, right down to the amplifier itself. Um, the amplifier is rated at about 85 watts per channel into 8 ohms, and I think about 110 into 4. And uh, it's, it's a really nice sounding amplifier. I said I wasn't going to be subjective, but it is a really nice amplifier. By sounding amplifier, I mean it really doesn't sound like anything. Um, I've owned a lot of amplifiers, and some you definitely hear some grunginess or some distortions and things that you may not notice right away, but when you live with them for a while, you do notice those things. So any really great amplifier you probably wouldn't hear at all. It might be very difficult to detect differences between the amplifiers. And this is definitely one of those. It was a very well-designed amplifier. It was pretty much flagship um, amplifier of um, the founder of Sansui. And Sansui, all they really made was um, amplifiers and audio equipment. They, they weren't doing um, dishwashers and things like that. So this is pretty much their specialty. So it's a great little amplifier. So let's start from the left here. You have a power on off switch right here. You switch it off. Everything goes off. There's an on. And when you turn it on, it also turns on speakers A, but you can also select B, C, or have A and B or uh, A and C. And my brother at uh, his home, he had uh, main speakers in the uh, living room, but he also had extension speakers out in the back in the bedroom. So he'd put holes down to the floor and run wires all the way to the back of the house. So, uh, you know, on weekends he could just play music through the whole house. It was pretty nice. So this, uh, when you select different speakers, um, it puts them in parallel. So if you have an eight ohm set of speakers, and you put two together, it, it'll make it a four ohm load. And this amplifier has no problem with that. There are some amplifiers made into probably 80, 80s or so where uh, they really didn't have enough current to drive four ohm speakers. So you'd find when you put speakers in uh, more than one were selected, it would put them in series, which means it would route out through one speaker set and back in through the other one. So two eight ohm speakers would actually be in series and become 16 ohms, which is a much lighter load for the amplifier, but necessary in some of those, you know, um, less capable amplifiers, shall we say. They were put out for a while there. Uh, they rely mostly on voltage to drive the speaker to some high power. Didn't have much current capability. This one has no problem running two sets of speakers. Uh, or even, you know, three all together, but only two at a time. So that's what the switch is all about. Now, you might think it's unusual to have a power switch and have it switch the speakers at the same time. It is a bit unusual, but it works really well in this unit because there's two headphone jacks and uh, one of them you can connect into directly and tap off the signal, but if you plug in the second headset of headphones, it switches off the speakers. So you could also do the same thing, I guess, if you selected to a set of speakers you didn't have connected. So if you didn't have any on C, for example, you could go to C and you'd have nothing coming out of the amplifier. But um, it's also kind of a unique situation where you can plug in two sets of headphones and uh, when you plug in the one on the bottom set, it will switch off the, the speakers. There's a speaker relay inside that handles the current, so it's not switched by the little connector here. It's actually a pretty robust relay. So then, next we get into it, we get some tone controls. And that's one of the nice things about this uh, amplifier. Uh, it has very usable tone controls. And what you've got here is bass, mid-range, and treble. So this is very similar to what you might find with a graphic equalizer, with a, a bit of an exception. So the mid-range control is what you call a peaking uh, equalizer. So where your response is flat from lows to highs, this puts a bit of a band in the middle. It's a pretty broad band, but you can select the frequency that you want here. So you've got C750 hertz, 1.5 kilohertz, or 3 kilohertz. So you can select that band that you want where you want a little bit of a boost or cut in the mid-range. And it's no more than about, I think, 5 decibels maximum boost or cut in the mid-range. But it's enough to, be, enough to be subtle. And if you do a little bit of a correction for a recording or something, it's a great way to do that. So you can either have it completely off or you can engage it in at any one of the three turnover frequencies you want. It's straight up and down is flat, so you can boost it or cut it. 
but in the middle, it has no effect at all, even if you've turned it on. And the same is true with the bass and treble controls. The difference with these two are, though, they call what they call a shelving equalizer. So rather than having that peak, it's actually more of a shelf. So if you want a little bit of a bass boost, it'll boost a little bit or boost a lot. But flat is straight across. So same thing with treble. If the treble comes up, it'll boost a little bit or it'll boost a lot. And if you have it at maximum, you get a big bump there. But it's a shelf. It doesn't do a peak. So that's the difference between the bass and the treble control here. And the bass and treble also have uh, turnover frequencies. You can defeat it to the left. 150, 300 hertz, or 600 hertz. And with the treble, you've got 6K, which is gonna be the most subtle because it's the highest frequency. And as you dip down the frequency, it goes to a three and a half or 2K. So I do like these tone controls. Um, I, have, I have some nice speakers in good, in good placement. And basically when you have really good speakers and, and good placement, I don't find any tone controls at all. Everything sounds really good. I can hear what the recording was meant to be. Yeah, some are a little heavier with bass or not, this and that, but uh, overall sounds very good. But there are times I think, well, yeah, that recording could really use a little bit of top end, or while wow, they mix this thing kind of bass shy, in which case I could just bring this thing a little bit, make a subtle adjustment and say, yeah, I'm enjoying that a little bit better now. But I always return it back to normal because typically in a good room with good speakers, um, I don't really need tone controls. But they're there if you want them, and it's nice to have. Um, the other thing you see over here are filters, and these are, uh, it's a low filter, 50 hertz and 100 hertz. So... 50 hertz is, uh, doesn't take off much of the bottom end, but if it's a little bit tubby, you can bring this in. I had a situation in a room one time where it was kind of overly bassy. I know some people love bass and say, oh, I love bass, but I, I don't like uneven bass. I'd rather have less bass or no bass if it's a few notes that are booming out because it, to me it distracts from the music. So that's basically what these low filters are for. Or maybe you have a muddy recording which is overly done on the bottom or it just, you know, 100 hertz right here is a little bit higher, definitely more audible. 50 is a lot more subtle, but out is in the middle position. And similar on the top end, you get a 12K uh, cut and a 6K cut. So uh, again, I don't use these very often, but nice to have. So that's all part of the preamp section of this um, integrated amplifier. The speaker switch obviously is actually part of the power amp because that's the output stage. It drives the actual speakers. Let's move on to the other half of this uh, unit here and talk a little bit more about this. This gets kind of interesting in here. So here you get your volume control. Uh, one of the nice things I like about this volume control is a really nice feel. It's very smooth feeling, but it has a great taper. So if I bring this up a little bit, I don't hear much volume at all. Now it's a little bit low right in here, and now it's a nice comfortable volume in here. So it runs a really nice range through here. Uh, actually, up four or five is pretty loud with most sources. If it's a really weak source, you might have to bring it up in here for high volume. I typically listen at pretty low volumes because uh, I don't want to damage my hearing. And my speakers sound great, and I tend to enjoy music at uh, much lower levels. So I think, I guess, probably maybe 75 to 80 dB is a good range. 85 from being pretty comfortable with a decent volume. That's that's pretty good volume. And it doesn't take much power to deliver that kind of uh, signal when you're in a pretty small room with fairly efficient speakers. But the volume control feels really nice here. What's cool, too, is it's got the, um, this uh, muting switch. It's not really full muting. Muting would imply that it shuts it off completely and mutes it. It's really an attenuator. It's kind of a misnomer. But it's minus 20 decibels. So basically, if you have this, uh, it, uh, say you get a good volume right about in here. If you put this on muting, drop by 20 dB, it'll be more comfortable range up in here. And this is nice if you're um, if you want a nice range to be adjusted for lower levels listening. You know, late at night or something, it's very comfortable. You just grab the knob and twist a little bit. But typically, what I use this for is for my turntable. So when I drop a uh, when I put a record on here, and um, I'll just drop this down to, to mute the speakers and then flip it right back up and I'm back to my normal level. So I can still hear things here. It's just at a lower level, but then I bring it back up. You know, something you might use if the phone rings or something like that. Some car stereos even have a muting button. You can tap it. You go to a drive through uh, window or something, you know, you can bring your stereo down and bring it right back to the level you're at. So muting is a nice switch to have. It's actually an attenuator. And over here, we've got a loudness control. It's kind of a traditional loudness control. Probably the one thing I don't like about this amplifier is the loudness equalization circuit. It's a little heavy for me. Um, and if I were to do, any to do any modifications, I probably would make it a little more subtle, but I just don't use loudness control at all. It boosts the bass and treble in the lower ranges of the volume control. Uh, as I've talked about with my uh, A7 Onkyo uh, amplifier video, uh, if you put the muting on, it's a little less um, noticeable because your volume's typically going to be up in this range, so it's a, a little more subtle, but still, I don't, I don't care for loudness. I don't, I don't need that. It just gives me too much bass. It's just too, too uneven. It, it's unnatural sounding to me. Uh, for my speakers in my room, uh, you know, your preferences may be different. So, of course, you got a balance control here. It, this was nice. There's no detent. 
it's just smooth. And I do find a lot of recordings are just slightly off. So while I'm sitting here in my easy chair listening, I'll show you the rest of my room sometime, but I, I can reach right over to the knob here and I can say, uh, yeah, it's slightly off balance and I'll just tap it to the left and get my image right dead center. So it's nice not having a detent. And I typically listen in the room with the dark lights out, believe it or not. This is my office and, uh, you know, I'm either sitting studying at my computer, um, doing my work. I work uh, one weekend a month at least, uh, steadily doing some patching and some other work. And I, um, I spend a lot of time studying and whatnot, but when I'm ready for a break, I close my eyes and the music goes out, uh, the drapes are drawn, and I just lay back and I put on music. I'll put on a side of an album or uh, I've got a squeeze box touch here too, so another music source, I have all kinds of sources from this. Um, so, you know, plenty of options for music to listen to, but uh, I don't need to be fiddling with knobs and looking at lights. I like it. Uh, I like the nice, I did mention too, with the nice orange light, nice orange glow. Very little light. I'm not into flashing things and indicators and whatnot. I like just, I like listening to my audio and my eyes closed because I get lost in it. And that's, that's my treat. So, um, back to the rest of this uh, amplifier here. There's a mode input. Uh, mode control. <laughs> focus there we go it's better um this is kind of neat so most amplifiers just pass the left channel through the left and the right through the right with this one you can reverse it and this kind of feature was pretty common on older amplifiers especially when we first get into the stereo amplifiers in the 60s uh, you can select either source sometimes you might have a mono source and you'd want that left source for example to play through both speakers and that was pretty common back in the days before everything was stereo so anyway it's kind of a holdout from that i suppose you can reverse the channels if you want so your left channel will go to the right and the right will go to the left just flips the two channels that way. It doesn't change phase, it just reverses the two speakers. And when you put it in this middle here, it's left plus right, which is basically mono. And in fact, all these ranges are monos, but left or right sources where you'll take with the button here. So here you play the right channel through both, left channel through both, or mono. Uh, mono is great if you have a tuner that's stereo, doesn't have a mono button on it. You'll find it cancels out a lot of noise because you take away all the noise from, uh, it's basically a differential signal. When you put it in mono, you won't hear that. And mono is also good for some records that were maybe recorded in mono. Maybe it was an old mono record and someone didn't have any skating on the record. One channel has a lot of noise because of the way the stylus warped the, rec the uh, record on one channel. Well, you really only need one channel of sound, don't you? So pick the one that's the quietest. So uh, this, this definitely has practical applications. And of course, last but not least, your input selector. And this is pretty straightforward. What's neat about this one too, it also has a mic input. So there are two quarter inch jacks on the back. In fact, uh, I won't show you in this video, obviously I can't turn this amplifier around, but if you look up the Sansui AU9500, you're gonna see an incredible number of connections on the back of this and level controls. It's a very flexible amplifier, but it's kind of fun. So the microphone input here, you've got on the back, and back in the day you could plug a guitar or bass or something into this too if you wanted to, I suppose, and play through it. Uh, or with the extension speakers, you got a little microphone, you could call somebody to dinner out in the backyard if your extra speakers were out. <laughs> speakers in the backyard, couldn't you? So it's kind of neat. Uh, and traditionally, you had two phone inputs back in the day because the phono was your primary source. Uh, you'll find a lot of amplifiers had that. Uh, one of the phone inputs on this one has adjustable loading in the back too, so you can um, uh, optimize it for the cartridge. And of course, tuner and auxiliary inputs. So this is your primary input selector. It doesn't stop there though, folks. There's some other neat possibilities with this uh, with this unit. Uh, it does handle two tape decks, and tape decks of the three-head variety. So people who aren't familiar with that, um, tape decks, a good tape deck, a three-head three tape deck, will have a separate record and playback head. And what that means is while you're recording your signal onto the tape, the tape will pass by the next head, which is playback head. You can actually hear the signal right off the tape. And the great advantage to that is while you're uh, recording, well, i got a tape deck right here I can show you. Um, this one, in fact, let's put this selector back on the tuner, put signal on. Ha! There we got the meters working now. But uh, I'm not going to turn it up because you'll you'll be hearing that, and I don't want to get into copyright issues. But uh, this is an old tape. In fact, I'll totally digress here for a minute. I'll show you. I pulled this tape out here. Ah! Let me open the box. This is a tape I made when I was 11 years old. Isn't that funny? I still got this thing. I uh, Todd Rundgren and, uh, and Led Zeppelin too, and I even put a little technical thing on there. Talk about what a geek I was back then, even, huh? I've always been into this stuff, but um, yeah, this tape is funny. I recorded this. Can you believe that when I was 11 years old? Um, anyway, this is a three-head deck, and it it, it uh, records the signal, but pulls it right back off the tape. And uh, so this deck, when you put this on tape monitor, there's no signal right now. But if I was in record mode, I could monitor the tape, the signal coming right off the tape. The advantage is I can hear the differences between different speeds and different bias settings. And, uh, and of course, how much saturation you get. If you don't put enough signal on the tape, it'll be hissy. If you put too much on, it'll start to distort. So that's the advantage of having a three-head machine. And with this uh, amplifier, you're able to play back two different tape decks with full monitoring capabilities. So that's why it says source here. It's, uh, uh, 
you play back tape deck one or two. And of course, each of your tape decks can either receive the source, source signal or you can dub. So if you have a cassette deck and an open reel, maybe tape deck one to two, you can dub one direction or the other. So this is a pretty common feature with two tape decks. On some units, you're gonna find that you only have uh, two tape monitor buttons. And if you turn on the first one, that automatically becomes the source you listen to. It'll, of course, it'll pass through to the second tape deck. Uh, my Pioneer SX780 is that way. Uh, and it's pretty common. But this one, when you see two separate switches like this, this is one of the uh, varieties of ways to allow you to um, copy stuff and not have to listen to the tape while it's copying. So I can dub one to two while I'm still listening to the tuner. Um, and then there's two other buttons here. There's a four channel adapter and noise reduction adapter. The noise reduction adapter is pretty cool. Uh, it's not that frequently used, but uh, back in the day, you could buy maybe an outboard Dolby unit. Um, TIAC had them, I think an AN60 or something. There was an Advent uh, Model 100, something like that. Um, but you could attach it to this amplifier. And basically, noise reduction adapter um, put itself, would, would, would open up a loop, and it would allow you to have a, a loop out and back in before the tape deck and after the tape deck. So it was good for an encode decode system. In fact, that's something like the DBX uses here. We've got a DBX 224 here um, that does uh, two to one, uh, one to two compression and expansion for noise reduction. And this handles a three head deck too. It does simultaneous encode decode. And that could be connected to this, uh, this unit, although I've actually chosen it to connect it in through um, this other processor here and, and tape selector here, but I'll get into that in some other video. But two-way tape dubbing doesn't stop there. You can plug in the noise reduction adapter, uh, which can be used for a couple other things, and a four-channel adapter, finally. This basically gives you a, um, another loop that allows you to bypass the volume control and go right back to the power amp through this. So there's a, um, it's, it's another loop you could use as a, as a tape monitor, basically, after these. But the intended purpose was to break the connection on this to go out to an adapter that would decode four channel signals so two of them can come back into this amplifier and the other two would go to a presumably another amplifier with a, with a rear channel uh, amplifier drive speakers. So that's a quick look at the, well, I don't want to say quick, but that's my Sansui AU9500. Hope you enjoyed the video and uh, take care.